Hello to everybody listening to the WMA podcast. We're all pumped to have you back. Today, we had a conversation with PJ Madsen and Melissa DeVantier. PJ is a financial advisor and development lead, and Melissa is a VP trust officer who deals with clients' estate planning through Nicolay Wealth Management. Their goals are to give back to the community through their core values and to bring vision to life. It's unique that this company offers clients different resources where they don't just have to work with financial planners. So stay tuned to listen to what Pete PJ and Melissa have to say about working in financial planning and dealing with estate planning while giving advice to individuals seeking wealth management. Hope you guys enjoy. Joining us on the podcast, I am here with Melissa and PJ from Nicolette uh, Wealth Management, and I'm very excited for them to be on the podcast. So thank you guys very much for coming on. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Um, So I just first wanted to talk about uh, specific questions for both of you. So, you know, PJ and Melissa, we can just kind of, you know, flip off. Uh, PJ, if you wouldn't mind just telling us, you know, a little bit about your po- your position at Nicolette Wealth Management and, um, you know, kind of how your company differs from from other firms. Yeah. So my um, my position at the at the bank is I'm responsible for our wealth management department, and that department is really made up of three core areas: our our trust department, our RIA and investment management group, as well as our retirement plan. Uh, division that would handle mostly corporate uh, retirement plans for corporations. So um, all in all, we we manage about $4 billion of clients assets um, and uh, have about 63, 64 people on the team as it stands today. Um, You know, so we're relatively new to Michigan, um, at least uh, Northern Michigan. One of our objectives is one of our objectives is to be known as Nicolet Bank in that market, because everybody in uh, Michigan so far has called us Nicolette. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, well, that's my mistake. It's, <laughs> it's all good. It's 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 common. It happens all the time. So no, it's uh, you know, and, and it's part of a growing bank, right? We're we're as a bank, we're the second largest bank headquartered in the state of Wisconsin. Um, as of December, it'll be around seven and a half billion dollars um, in, in size, and um, it just wealth manages management is just one piece of that. Melissa, do you have anything else to add, or could you kind of talk about uh, your position as well? Yeah. Um, so I'm a trust officer at the bank, and so I break that down into basically two major functions. Um, when it comes to kind of estate and trust planning with customers of the bank. And so uh, one part of that would be on the proactive side where we're sitting down with customers and talking to them about their estate planning options, um, helping them to understand how the estate planning and trust planning piece fits in with their overall wealth strategy. Um, So, for example, just this morning, we sat down with a couple um, who is going to uh, move some assets over to us for um, for investment management. And uh, they have a major liquidation event. Um, so he's selling a, a big chunk of a business. And so there's gonna be a lots of liquidity all of a sudden. So they're gonna, in, um, helping them to understand how the estate planning and trust planning piece fits in with their overall wealth strategy. Um, so for example, just this morning, we sat down with a couple um, who is going to uh, move some assets over to us for um, for investment management, and uh, they have a major liquidation event. Um, so he's selling a, a big chunk of a business, and so there's going to be a lots of liquidity all of a sudden. So they're going to invest that money with us. And and I was at the table to talk about how does that fit in with the estate planning piece of that. What does their estate plan look like? How do we plan for it to grow? And assuming all goes well, and we live to our life expectancy, what's that look like? But what if you know something happens and uh, planning that part of it. So that's the proactive side. On the on the uh, reactive side, I guess you could say, um, the trust administration happens after somebody's passed away, usually. Uh, sometimes there are trusts that exist during a person's lifetime. 
Um, but oftentimes we're involved in post-death administration or we've been named as the trustee of somebody's trust where we're in charge of making sure that the trust terms are followed and that's done through our trust department. So that would be the other component of my, of my role here. Yeah, that's great. And for the people that don't know, Melissa actually has a very unique background because she is in um, the estate planning end of the industry. And she actually went to law school and kind of took a different route than most people working with financial advisors or people who are financial advisors. So I guess, Melissa, could you kind of give us, you know, a background on how you ended up in, you know, the estate planning side of it? And, you know, just as a, a little reminder to you guys, people at Michigan State right now are, you know, in the wealth management minor, they're taking classes at MSU that are required. So we're actually in an estate planning and tax class right now. Um, so could you also kind of talk about how that would be important for us and, you know, the benefits we should get from that? You bet. Um, so, and it is kind of funny how our paths, you know, sometimes differ than, you know, from where we thought they were going to go. So I uh, was in law school, uh, basically to become a business attorney. So I did law school during the day and I uh, took my MBA courses at night uh, for three years. And so when I graduated, I, I did a kind of a dual degree track. So I graduated with a JD MBA after those few years in, in law and business school. And then when I finished, I became a business transactions attorney. And a lot of my work um, in, in the business transactions world was for succession planning for business owners. And what I, what I came to learn is that a lot of business owners uh, wanted to talk about their business succession plan but they didn't even have a, a will or a trust or any sort of personal estate plan put together, even though the business was the, the major asset in the estate. And so we, we really started to get in front of business owners and talk to them about why it's important not just to think about what's going to happen with the business succession, but the what ifs of, you know, it doesn't, our best laid plans don't always work out the way that we think they're going to and how the estate planning piece comes into play there. And so I started to pick up on more of the estate planning work um, and, and learned that part of the trade. And that was really the part that I came to enjoy the most um, was the estate planning. So I could really cast the net beyond just business owners and work with a, a wide variety of clients, everybody from newlyweds that wanted to do some basic wills all the way up to, you know, high net worth families and business owners that needed to plan um, something a little bit more sophisticated. Um, so and so now at the bank, I basically get to, to do that same kind of planning as part of a team with the other advisors. So the financial advisors, the private bankers, the commercial uh, loan officers, um, you know, the investment portfolio managers, all of those uh, folks are right at the same table with me. And we're talking to these customers, not just about these very siloed off segments of their wealth plan, but we get to talk about the whole comprehensive plan now. And I'm you know, one of the advisors at the table for that. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's very unique. Um, you know, that kind of leads me into my next question too. And I promise PJ, we'll get back to you soon. Um, I was just going to ask how your team, you know, how you have engaged with your team, you know, during this process and how you have been able to use, you know, your talents, you know, when developing, you know, estate plans for, you know, the advisors, you know, clients. Sure. Um, that's a great question because it's really been different and it's probably how I've come to understand all the different aspects of the bank because the banking industry is re relatively new to me. I was an estate planning attorney for 15 years, but didn't do a lot in the financial services industry. I kind of referred out clients to go meet and talk about all that stuff with somebody else. So now I get to be part of the conversation, which is way more fun. Um, but I get brought in by different uh, members of the bank for all different reasons. So this morning's meeting, for example, I was brought in by a private banker who was working with um, the client because um, the client's going to move a lot of their banking over to Nicolay uh, for you know their deposit accounts and things like that. But they also wanted to talk to somebody about investment strategies and estate planning. So I was brought into the meeting for to cover those pieces. Uh, sometimes I'm brought in because a commercial loan officer knows that their their uh, commercial client is getting ready to sell, 
and they they know that the customer needs to talk to somebody about what to do with the uh, liquid assets after the business is sold and they're sitting with a pile of cash. And so, you know, I kind of come in as part of the team to, to talk about that as well. So it, it's really unique. Sometimes uh, somebody's come into a branch and they're asking a teller about, you know, do you know anybody that I can talk to about some questions that I have about my will or about a trust um, or about you know, long-term care planning or something. And so sometimes it's just a matter of getting in front of the customer and ask and answering some basic questions, but it's all of the client facing members of our bank that end up pulling me in from, for various reasons. Absolutely. And I think that's a point that, you know, Nicolay is unique because I feel like this is just honestly, just a curious question for me, but I feel like, you know, as a client, you think the advisor knows everything, but I think Nicolay is unique because they have a position you know, for you that they bring in, you know, an external resource as yourself and they get to talk about, you know, more specifics as it, you know, pertains to the, to the uh, estate planning and not just the advisor's job, I guess, to relay all that information to them. They have someone like you to, to talk to about that. Right. Yeah. But that was, you know, PJ and the, and the leadership in our wealth department identified that as a, as a need that customers had. And instead of just referring people off right away to get on the billable clock with the lawyers, they instead brought in, uh, you know, me and other resources like me just to sit at the table and, and be right there in front of the customer while they're already at Nicolay meeting with their other advisors. So it's been really well received. Absolutely. That's great. Um, so PJ getting into uh, your position. So obviously you are a financial planner and you are the development lead. So could you kind of talk about your responsibilities day to day and, um, you know, kind of just your typical client experience, I guess you could say. Yeah. So no, I would say my, my day to day is different than it was for 15 years as an advisor and, um, and independent and in being an independent, it's, it's the structure that you'll see a lot of advisory firms and, and that's what I came up in where you have your clients, you have your revenue, you have your expenses, you're compensated based on those types of things. My role here since joining the bank in 2016 has, has changed significantly because my, my responsibility now is for the team as a whole and the client deliverable. Um, I, there's something that Melissa said five or six times that is part of our culture and she never once referred to herself. Um, she always referred to the team and our whole objective in, in, in building the best client deliverable we can is to put a team around each client that can specifically meet that client's needs. Um, Jake, we talked last time, you know, I'm a CFP, right? I have, I have, I have several strengths. I also have several places where other people on the team are far stronger than I am. Um, so it's nothing to see, you know, three or four different advisors in a client meeting, especially clients with more complex situations here. Um, there's nobody that gets individual credit for it. Nobody's asking for individual credit for it. Our job is to grow our client base, expand the services we can provide and be basically information centers and problem solvers for our client base. You know, in, in a world where we're starting to see a lot of things be commoditized, right? You can mm -hmm. jump on any broken platform and, and they'll build a model for you. You can, you know, you can set these things up yourself. You can use mint.com to do a, you know, a financial plan. You can do all these different things. The, and that stuff will continue to get more and more competitive and better and better over time. Our job is to build a team that can continually add additional value uh, ar around the client relationship. And the only way we're going to be able to do that long term is by bringing in and leveraging people with skill sets and different skill sets like Melissa, like, you know, Jake and Adam and several other members of our team that, that have unique backgrounds and specific strengths. Um, so, so really the whole, the whole deliverable here is, is built around how can we continually add value to client relationships? Absolutely. I think for me, team is the most important thing. And that's why I appreciate that point, um, you know, so much is because, you know, you guys are both selfless and it, it is with the team, the team, the team, the team, uh, as U of M would say. Um, but 
you know, I, I, I guess my question for you is how does working in a team when advising clients, you know, how is that different than, cause usually when you think of a client meeting, you think of a client and, you know, the advisor giving them advice. So I guess how do you, you know, relay information to your team? How do clients work together with the same clients to, you know, develop these plans? Yeah, I would say that some, the majority of the time, um, somebody, one or maybe two people will take the lead role in, from a relationship standpoint. It's the person that, that, that you just kind of find yourself uh, jiving with. If there's three of us at the table, any one of them could do it, right? And, and sometimes that can change over time. If I'm working with a private banker and myself and Melissa, it, you know, the private banker might have the relationship for 15 years. They just brought us in to add value. They'll run point. They'll do the scheduling. They'll set up, you know, they'll make sure before the client comes in they, that we know, you know, what the things are that we need to be talking about, what's important and relevant in that client's life at the time. But we, you know, somebody usually runs point. From that, from there, we do a lot of pre-planning for meetings to make sure that everybody knows um, what to expect, can be prepared to present and provide relevant information to the client, and so that we're not wasting their time or ours. So it's there's a lot of work that goes in on the front end to make sure that that you know 45 minutes or hour or hour and 15 minutes that you have with that client is is the best use of their time and ours as well. So we'll, we'll see that go on in, in different stages. We might include Melissa in a meeting in um, uh, April, and then when we meet in fall, right, it, it might be the portfolio manager looking at tax harvesting and things like mm -hmm. that. She might not be involved. We're still communicating and, and recording everything and, and all the documents and, and keeping everybody in the loop, but it all goes into plain and as who's adding value in that particular point. Mm -hmm. So I guess as you know, from a client perspective, you know, there's millions and millions of firms and obviously billions of people. How do they know what advisors to work with? I guess you could say, you know, how do they search for different firms? How do they know that you guys will give them, you know, the biggest bang for their buck? It's, you know, it's largely, it's building your name in the communities that you serve. Um, you know, we're a, we are a community bank. Um, now we're getting to be a larger community bank, but that doesn't change the fact that we go about our business and we go about working with our clients um, because they live with us in the communities that, that we serve. Um, you know, you, I'm personally, physically in, in Green Bay, Melissa's in Appleton. Um, we have a, a team in both those locations. We have a team in Wausau um, and, and North, you know, we're to be the size we are without any intention currently of having a branch in Milwaukee or Madison. And the reason is, is because we don't believe as a bank that we can make a real difference in those, in those markets. Um, our goal, you know, we, we become a commodity. We don't want to be a commodity. We want to mm -hmm. be the best bank in the area, in each area that we serve. And, and we work very hard at making sure that we stay focused on that. And, and our people that live in those communities are engaged in the, in the community, are involved, are participating, not just financially, but with their time as well. So really our, our whole goal as a community bank is to continually increase the relevance um, that our organization has in the communities that we serve. You know, that comes with that comes with a certain level of responsibility. It also comes with a certain level of brand recognition and things like that. Because as, as we do a better job um, being visible, we also, um, you know, we're, we also become front of mind. Some client uh, feedback that I've re received too that um, goes to your question, Jake, is that um, I, I think a lot of clients find us and, and maybe interview or, or research a, a sub, several different financial institutions to work with and end up um, really appreciating that Nicolay hits kind of a, a sweet spot. I, I hear a lot of clients say, you know, I had an investment advisor, but all he does is, you know, the investment piece. And I, I have so many needs beyond what that one person can provide. So I've grown too big for the one man shop. But I'm also not feeling like I get any individualized or, or, or personal service from the big mega banks, so mm -hmm. to speak. So they might have all of these services available, but they're not sitting at the table with me. You know, I, my advisor is 
calling legal, whoever that is, and running something past legal, and then legal comes back and gives um, some recommendation. But I'm not sitting across the table from the attorney that's making a recommendation or, or giving suggestions about things that I could consider. So I think we're finding a really uh, sweet spot that is um, resonating with a lot of customers because they're saying, well, this is right. It's all the services I need, and it's also right here sitting at the table with me and in a personal way at a local branch right here in my community. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an excellent point. And, you know, I'm kind of talking about, you know, from the client's, you know, perspective, because I want to be a client, I guess, right now. I mean, you know, I'm I'm young, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear these kind of things. So I guess that leads me into my next question is, you know, is there maybe room for more than one advisor in a client's life? Is that something common that you might see, you know, maybe with you know, an estate planner such as yourself, and then, you know, you have the investment side, is it fine to do that as a client? Is that safe? Can me to answer that, Melissa? I, sure. Do you, mean, do you mean multiple people at our organization, or do you mean, ha or do you mean, you know, where people will come and say, um, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket, so I'm giving X to you and, and Y to, um, to somebody else, kind of like that? I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. We see it. We see it more and more. Um, and then what happens usually is they start gravitating toward the person that they that they feel that they're getting the the most service from. Um, so so initially, people's you know, especially on the investment side, their their biggest fear is is making a mistake. Right. Mm -hmm. Selecting two people feels like less of a mistake. At least I can only make a mistake on half of my assets or, or something like that. Um, until you give them a really a, a real reason to to want to be, have everything in one place. For us, so, some of those reasons are um, we can have you know more visibility into the information. We have um, from the investment side, you look at things like that where um, as, as we look at the investments, we don't have to worry about what the other person's trading if we're doing some things for tax loss harvesting. So not, there's not things that are offsetting each other. Um, from a legal side, if they make an adjustment to beneficiaries, titling, registrations, whatever it might be, we can make that broad based across all their accounts as opposed to hoping the guy at, you know, the other organization did it properly. So I think mm -hmm. as they start to see us, what usually ends up happening for clients that do separate their assets to multiple advisors, they usually do end up, you know, gravitating toward one over time as their comfort builds. A lot of times it's a, that's an easy answer to, um, I just got this windfall of dollars, whether it's retirement funds or sold the business or whatever it might be. How do I, how do I take that? They, you know, I, I met with this guy, I met with this, th this woman, and I met with this other gentleman. Uh, I like two of them. I'm going to split it up. And from there, we, we accept the role that, that they ask us to play, but then continue to service them, you know, you know, with the, with, the objective of hopefully managing the entire relationship over time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Melissa. I was just going to say one trend that I've noticed um, over the past few months is a lot of clients that we meet with, and maybe it's true, especially amongst like older, older clients, older couples. What, what I see um, as their background is they started off maybe with nothing or very little and then they accumulated randomly over the course of their marriage or their lifetimes, all of these assets here and there, you know, they have this old 401k at the old um, job that they used to have. And they've got this account that they set up, you know, at a bank or another financial institution somewhere along the way. And, and then they come and they sit down with us and they say, we have all these things, but we don't really have a good handle comprehensively on what we even have. I couldn't tell you like what, what my net worth is because there's just all these little piecemeal accounts everywhere. And, so even though the, the diversification concept seems appealing on paper, what they end up really wanting at the end of the day is one place that they can go and work with a team of people that understands the whole picture. And I think it's true, especially for some of our older couple clients. I, what I hear frequently um, is one of them is the financial guru in the marriage and the other one isn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the financial guru is always worried. What, ha what if something happens to me? You know, how is my spouse going to know, 
you know, what to do and where to go and, you know, how to manage all this going forward. And so having starting to consolidate all of that at one financial institution brings people a lot of peace of mind and gives them just a lot of comfort knowing if something happens to me and I'm the only one that's ever been managing all of this, all he or she has to do is call Nicolay and come establish a meeting. They'll bring on all the team members that need to be at the table and, and they'll be okay. And I, I hear that a lot as kind of a, okay, that makes more sense. Maybe diversification isn't as big of a deal if peace of mind can be achieved by, you know, keeping everything under one roof. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, so kind of relating the client experience to age, I know we talked last time we talked, but, you know, a fear for of mine and maybe a lot of other people at state that are in wealth management is age. Age is the biggest discrimination in this field um, is, you know, what it makes it out to be. So I kind of just wanted both of your perspectives on, you know, things that maybe students should be doing right now on, you know, how to benefit themselves the most. And, you know, why would someone, you know, 60, 70 years old that's worked their entire life, you know, to, you know, provide for their family, and then they give it to some, you know, 22, 23 year old kid just out of school. Could you guys kind of talk about maybe your experience with that or, or your opinions about that? Yeah, I can, I can definitely give you my opinion. I, I started at age 23 and, and you're, you're, you're right in one degree that it is, it is a challenge, right? It's hard if, if you have a 50 year old person that's been doing it for 20 years and has 20 years experience competing for a million dollar account, and a 23 year old that's been doing it for 12 minutes competing for a um, million dollar account, there's going to be, there's, it, it is stacked against you. Yeah. Our job here at Nicolet is to provide an environment that allows people to learn um, without having the pressure of having to bring in that account and really develop young talent and all talent to be able to play an, act, an, an active role on the team. So to give you an example, we have, we just hired in the last four, four months, we've hired six people under 23, 24, right in that, out, right out of school. Um, they're working together. They're becoming valuable members of the team. They're getting, you know, they're getting a ton of education. We engage them in the client relationship and everything because there does come a day and it's earlier than you think where um, your age goes from your biggest um, obstacle to your greatest asset. And the reason is, is because the, the person that you've been working with for the last five years as part of the team or, or seven years or whatever, if they have another relationship, largely it's close to their age. So if I'm looking to retire at 65 and my advisors, my buddy from the golf course, that's also 65, he's probably leaving the same time. Our job is, is to be there and have a, a, a group and, and succession built in for all these, for all of our clients and make sure that we continually uh, train and enhance that. In addition, when you're growing as fast as we are, the, the individuals, individuals coming out of school right now are incredibly talented and many times have a very different skill set for no other reason than the time you grew up. Um, as it relates to technology and everything else that can really add value to the team really fast. And we, we try and leverage that as much as possible. Um, even to go so far as to, we have a, we have kind of a formal training program. That's a few years long to just get people different exposure. Um, we don't usually put young people in a sales role right away. And I say sales, it's, it's all service, but in, in front of a client to, win or lose this this account mm -hmm. and the reason is it's not fair to them and if you do that there's there's a much higher uh, probability that they'll they'll leave or, or not be as happy because it, it doesn't feel good to to lose or not get an account when, the, when when people are counting on you we'd rather pair them up with um experienced people and and let them figure out how to work together so we we invest quite a bit I mean, with, with six new hires, you know, in the last few months, you can, we're, we're, we're putting our, our money where our mouth is from an investment standpoint, just because we really want, we really want to be developing, developing young talent, um, and developing it continually. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the most important thing. And for me personally, I'm concerned about, you know, the employee training and, you know, my first job, I want to learn as much as I possibly can. And I think that companies that actually invest in young talent is huge and something that college students look for like myself. So I appreciate that point. Yeah. The cost, the cost of bringing somebody younger in is not in your wage. Um, it's in the time, effort and energy that to do it right, that comes along with it, you know, from the people that, from the people you surround yourself with that work. Um, it's a tremendous amount of work to get people to the point where you have the, you have technical knowledge from your degree. Um, practical application of that is, is one of the things that takes a little while to develop. And um, the only way you can really do it is by, by being part of a group that's, that's working toward and, and is invested in invested in your success. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on that. Absolutely. Melissa, did you have anything to add? No, I would just, um, I guess my only suggestion would be to keep in mind that these customers also want somebody who's going to be around to help their kids. I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. And so um, a, a common frustration that I hear from customers is that they, you know, all their advisors are retiring <laughs> and now they're trying to find, you know, what, what used to be my, my greatest uh, weakness in age. Well, I, I've gotten older for one thing, but I've also learned that people want younger advisors that are going to stick around and be able to help their kids someday. So I think if you can demonstrate that, you know, you're smart and hardworking and you have a deep bench of knowledge behind you that the client also has access to, and you're going to be around to help their kids someday too, that, that uh, you know, weakness turns into a real strength. Absolutely. That's a win-win right there. Right. Um, so two more questions for you guys. One, just kind of a last general piece of advice for any college student that's that wants to go into wealth management. I mean, what are some things that we should be doing right now to benefit ourselves, you know, five, 10 years down the road? And, you know, kind of a, a personal finance question, but you know, how do we put ourselves ahead financially as well? You know, not only looking for a job and succeeding in, you know, the advising industry and advising career, but what can we do financially right now? I would, I would say right now, um, financially, the, the best thing you can do financially as you go out and start looking for jobs and things like that is to not do it from a financial, uh, don't do it financially. Um, we, I would say we right out of the gate pay below market for our, for our younger, our younger talent or our, our newer talent. And the reason is, is we want people that take the job because it's the best long-term opportunity for them. Um, mm -hmm. but that's, if I make it about pay from day one, it's going to be about pay, you know, every day there forward. Um, we do, I think we do a good job of evaluating talent and evaluating people and continually moving them on. But if you asked our group, if you asked our group here, um, we put a lot of resource into the training and the um, formal education after we pay for CFP, we pay for, you know, uh, CTFA or whatever other, um, programs that that people are interested in um, in addition to that we move we move their comp along but from our standpoint in, in a world where everything is um, is largely based on paying contracts and um, and payouts and things like that you know again it's where we're different every person here is on salary with a bonus structure we're paid just like the rest of the bank so we don't have any advisors that are um, that our commission or variable compensation in any way, shape, or form. And I think that's one thing that totally differentiates us in the market. It, and the reason for that is we want to create a culture where people are not competing against the person next to them. To your point earlier, Jake, you said there's, you know, a million financial firms, you know, what makes you guys different? That's one of them. Um, there's very few places where you're not competing with your neighbor inside, inside of your walls. We wanted to, we wanted to break that down and really create an environment where people could collaboratively work around the client, around the client and the client experience. So my, my recommendation for financially is that first job, 
go to the place that's going to provide you with the most opportunity to learn and grow mm -hmm. right? before you look at it from a financial standpoint because that'll come melissa yeah i um I would just echo what PJ said. I think, uh, you know, I've worked several places. Um, I don't know that we have an environment or, uh, you know, kind of the social norm is to have one job that you take out of college and work there for the rest of your life. Although I know quite a few people who've done just that. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. And, and if you get it right the first time, you know, to, to stick around and make a career out of it, I think is a, is a great path. I, I guess my advice, maybe it goes along with what PJ just said, but it's to look for culture. Um, and he talked about it in terms of, you know, education and, and growth. And I think that's right on. I would just say, too, that the, the overall culture that I, I believe in leadership that kind of trickles down in terms of the culture and what does that look like? What what do you want your life to look like and your work life to look like? Um, and and to choose based on what that should what that should look like for a long term strategy. Um, I think a lot of times we um, when we first get out of school we want to take the the highest paced um, mm -hmm. highest paying you know uh, best resume building kind of a job, but maybe it's a soul killer. <laughs> at the same time and I think that there you don't have to choose that way it can be a a good job that doesn't you know kill your spirit and and helps you really build and and have a long career someplace and I think that that's what I'm excited about at Nicolay I think that we've got a great culture here so I hope that people will um, research that well no absolutely and, go, and going back to your your last point you know from what I've heard you know, people don't really like their first job, then the second job's the exact opposite than the first job, then right around the third or fourth job is where you start to settle in. So I've heard all kind of all kinds of ways to say it, but yours sounded kind of like that. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, so last thing I have for you guys is if there is any, you know, outlets of information, resources that you guys use on a day-to-day -day basis, this could be books, podcasts, blogs, Anything like that that would help us, you know, as students become more financially literate? What what uh, recommend? Uh, I'm sorry. What recommendations would you guys give? I I have one off the top of my head that I just looked at today, PJ. If you want me to jump in, go for it. I I really like the Kiplinger letter. Um, it's really short, and and I tend to be somebody who's pressed for time, and uh, you know, efficiencies are very important to me. So. Um, the Kiplinger letter gives me like a one to four page summary of everything that's be all the uh, court digest of major things, you know, Supreme Court or big court of appeals kind of things that will affect the way I do business and um, and new laws that are either being proposed with a pretty good chance of passing or that were just passed or some tax court decision that's going to affect the way that I advise uh, clients. And so that Kiplinger letter for me is nice and short and sweet and always to the point. Mm -hmm. I, I do not spend much time with the Kiplinger letter. <laughs> um, we, uh, yeah, I, I think everybody has, has different things. If we had a couple other people on here, it'd be Bloomberg and, and whatever else. Um, I think that all those, there's a lot of resources out there, podcasts. I don't know. Michael Kitsis has a nice one. Um, there's, there's several others. Really, I try and I rely on a lot of the people around here to, to share information as stuff comes and becomes relevant, right? There's a lot of noise out there too. So, you know, when we see something that intrigues us or whatever else, we, we try and build a, you know, we try and share it with, with others um, internally and, and really understand, you know, what we're seeing in the market. Some of the, you know, some of the things that I look at are some of the horror stories and stuff like that, just because you also got to know what, um, what not to step in, if you will. <laughs> No, and I appreciate that, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you guys being on the podcast. And, uh, you know, thanks a million for your time. We all appreciate it. Yeah, and the one thing, I, one thing real quick in kind of closing, um, we're available to you guys. If people have questions, as you start going through um, the job search and, and things like that, we're, I mean, we're always looking to hire young talent. But even if you just want to use it for a resource to really understand what, you know, what you're looking at and, and what's out there, you know, I'm familiar enough with an, enough of the companies and enough of the structures and things like that, that 
we're happy to help in any way we can. Our, our objective is, you know, to, to hopefully over time grow a relationship um, with Michigan State now that we're, you know, we have a much larger presence in uh, in the state of Michigan and and so on. So whatever whatever we can do to help, we want to be a resource for, for anybody that would want to reach out. Absolutely. We appreciate that. And we, uh, as students, love utilizing our resources. So uh, thank you guys a million. If you like what you just heard, please like, comment, and share. This is Lance Mullen, producer of the MSU WMA podcast. MSU WMA, or Michigan State University Wealth Management Association, is a student organization part of the Eli Broad College of Business, located in East Lansing, Michigan. Our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation of financial planners. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed, please check out our channel on all platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And check out our social media at MSUWMA and MSUWMA.com. Mm-hmm.